thank you for watching the film Overland as part of the 33rd annual Virginia Film Festival. I'm here with panelists Elizabeth Haviland James and Revere Lanou uh, to talk about the film. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I, I am so excited uh, to, to be talking with you all today and to have a discussion about the movie. So I got a chance to watch Overland last night. And just before we start the discussion, I want to say as a 30 year falconer, uh, I was emotionally uh, moved and emotionally touched by the film. It was great. It captured falconry and the perils and the trials of falconry well. So thank you for thank taking you. the time and, and the portion of your life, the five years uh, of your life to put it together. It was really interesting. Um, one of the things that, that, that I saw in the film that was mentioned a number of times, and that was also um, I talked about in some subsequent interviews you did, is you talked about the, the transient connection to the wild. Uh, and I heard that, that phrase a lot. What, what, what does that mean to you? What the transient connection to the wild? And, and, and how does that relate to the film? It, it just was an overriding th uh, theme, and I'm kind of curious how that, what that means to you and how it kind of played into the film. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words about the movie. It's always really stressful to show it to a falconer because <laughs> they can be a picky breed, but uh, we really appreciate that you enjoyed the film and we hope that's true for the audience also. Um, Great to be part of that. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to be showing the film at the Virginia Film Festival. Um, so thanks to them. I know it's been a hard year for festivals to put these events together. So we're really delighted to be able to start sharing the film with audiences. Um, you know, back to your question though, that theme of our sort of fading distant connection to the wild is not something that we knew the film was going to be about when we started filming. But as we immersed in the lives of Lauren and Giovanni and Khalifa, the three characters at the heart of the story, we realized that we're spending so much time in a pseudo reality, you know, with our phones, with our computers, even when we're outdoors, half the time we're, you know, like trying to figure out how to frame <laughs> our reality. And because of the pursuit that they're engaged in and the absolute um, attention that it requires, they have this really visceral, really inspiring awareness and connection that um, became for us and for our film crew a little bit um, contagious. You know, <laughs> it was really, there was just something in the air. When you release, as you know, a bird of prey into the off of your wrist, you don't know what's going to happen. And that kind of excitement, we just lose in most of our everyday interactions. And so that definitely became one of the threads in the editing room as we were putting the story together. And as we realized that this was as much a reaction to the world that we're living in presently as it is a reflection of the stories that we were seeing unfold in front of us. Great. Uh, so how did, how did, Falconry is not the normal topic of a documentary. How, how did you guys uh, wander into the, to the idea to do the film? Um, I think basically it was, it was a twofold thing. We were working on a film uh, in the swamps of Arkansas, trying to, the film was about trying to find the ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, and we met a falconer and got to see a very small glimpse of what falconry looks like. This happened to be a falcon on a duck. Um, oh, cool. And just kind of clock, clock that away is like, that's kind of an interesting thing. We're going to try and find this woodpecker, but that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and then later on, I was doing a, a painting project and came across this image of an Arabian falconer from like maybe the 50s. And I was like, that's gorgeous. Um, what do these two things have in common? You know, what's going on in, in Arkansas in the swamps and then what's going on in the desert? And then when we found out that it is this ancient tradition and it goes through the Silk Road and it connects all of these um, parts of our social and cultural past we thought let's look into this yeah no and that's 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 is that's i appreciate that but there really is nothing like watching a duck come down from a thousand feet and whack a duck out of the air <laughs> so and you know we, we one of the things that that i heard you mention a number of times uh throughout the film uh was that falconry 
isn't really about the kill, it's about the process, right? It's about the predation. It's about the, um, uh, it's, a, it's a low success rate. Uh, it, it, are there any things that, that any insights that you have uh, really uh, uh, that you gain from that, you know, low success rate predation, uh, any insights that you gain from that? Any, any interesting kind of thoughts on, the, on really on their success and it's about the chase, not the kill? We have five years of thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. You know, we've, we've been um, having that conversation, you know, ever, ever since we started from, from people kind of forgetting where food came from and forgetting the role of predators and some, you know, so much in our culture, the predators are the bad, the bad guys. And it's like, well, that's how the food chain works. You take the predators out and, you know, everything breaks down. Um, I think, at least from my point of view, in, in making the film, we actually uh, had some trepidation about the first one, you know, that w when the first actual um, successful hunt would happen and sort of how to cover that. I, emotionally, at least, I, you know, I was a little worried about that. But then you, you really are rooting for, for the, the predator, for the, for the bird of prey, because you understand that this is what they've been designed to do. Um, and it just looks like the way nature plays out in this really magnificent and beautiful way. And for us, when we showed an early, early cut of this, um, where Miles successfully gets his first rabbit and the audience cheered, we went, okay, you know, this, this feels right to us. Yeah. I mean, I think it was something that we talked a lot about. We talked a lot about how we would film what would happen after the the first successful hunt but the reality was that we had to film for many 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 days in order to get <laughs> that hunt i mean miles may have been successful but we missed the shot or it was really far away or you know he he barely he barely got it and i remember being in oklahoma it was freezing cold out our film crew was tired it was windy the drone was having issues. I mean, there was just like one of those days where I just wanted to go back to bed. I was exhausted. We'd been filming for several days. We had yet to have a successful hunt. And it dawned on me that this is all great because- For the film. For the film, yeah. because if we just had, you know, every time you released the bird, it was successful, it would be pretty boring. And it would be pretty boring. It would be pretty boring. And, you know, it made it, um, it was exhausting because those, especially an eagle, can cover so much ground so quickly. And we're a really nimble film crew. We don't um, have a huge number of people to run after us with gear. So our <laughs> cinematographer, Revere, and myself, our sound guy, and occasionally a camera assistant would be, you know, grabbing everything and running down, trying to chase after Lauren, chase after the bird. It was this really sort of comedy, especially in the beginning, before we had any clue about how to predict how things might happen. But the worst thing to do is to overly sort of say, okay, hopefully the rabbit will run this way and then the eagle will come in over here and we'll be able to, and then. <laughs> that, never, that never happens. So no. they, Bunny they, didn't get the memo. He doesn't take that's directions. Right. They say that you never want to work with kids or animals, and yeah. you actually absolutely found out why. Uh, the, it, it, and so it's, it's interesting. I, I thought that the, uh, as I looked at and watched the way you filmed uh, the, the, first, uh, rat, the first rabbit kill that was uh, successful that you filmed, uh, it was done with great respect, right? I mean, this is part of the, the circle of life. Uh, and I think that a lot of people uh, have forgotten that. And Revere, you mentioned earlier uh, you, we've had a growing disconnect from uh, how food is made and how food is produced. And really, I think uh, in today's world, and we found, we found this out during COVID, how tenuous that production chain is, right? I mean, we've had uh, meat packing, one meat packing plant closes down and we have doubling of prices. And so it's good for people to remember that it's, uh, that it's, it's really, uh, it, it, well, so you, it, it's really, tied into our inner core. I mean, this, this hunter and gatherer is really key to what we do. Um, so I, I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, well, well, actually, 
so when you when you captured that first that, that first rabbit uh, uh, the chase and and the the successful hunt of the eagle, what were your emotions like? Did you know, hey, this is it? Did did you know, oh man, this is the film, or was it not later until the editing room? What were some of the emotions you had around that? You talked about being nervous uh, about how you were going to present it and how you would take it. So what were some of the other emotions that you had around like actually seeing that? You know, so we were really fortunate to film. Uh, the storyline that you're talking about right now is Lauren McGow and she's oh, right. a, Thank you. she's yeah she's an eagle she works with an eagle two eagles in the course of our film and she is such a thoughtful uh well-educated soulful person that we had the great benefit of having had many conversations um some of them recorded audio interviews and some of them just sitting around, you know, after a long day of filming right. about the experience that we knew a little bit about what to expect, but we were really cheering for her because, you know, it was a long journey with Miles. And I think that we were able to sort of, you can't react in the moment when you're filming, you have to react in the edit room because if you react okay. in the moment when you're filming, you're going to miss the moment. So you have to keep your eye on the prize. You know, we're oftentimes, Revere and I are sort of standing behind the action, watching a monitor to make right. sure that we actually are getting what we need. To find it. Yeah. So it's a, you're a little bit divorced from what's happening at that moment. And then that night you get back to your hotel room or the house you've rented and everyone pours a whiskey and it's like this great release of, oh my God, did that actually just happen? So it's like a delayed <laughs> A delayed response. Um, I, well, I'm I, glad you found the most important part of falconry, which is whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> no good have hands without a nice whiskey or a scop, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, we, we, I think, put great care into the, the three characters that we chose to feature in the film. We met a lot of falconers all over the world and we were looking for falconers who we believed were ethical, who we believed were um, well-versed in the history of the tradition, who were really connected to it, who we felt like would be our portal into the sort of ancient nature of the tradition. Right. Um, so a lot of the sort of style of the editing and the respect that comes through in the film is driven by the very characters that that are in it. Yeah, I think well, yeah. Just to just ahead. to add on to that, it's, it's it was a relationship that we worked on, and then once we all began to respect each other, and you realize you share a value system with with we with these falconers, then you can kind of turn over your response to them and feel the response through them. So if they're happy about something, you're happy about something. Oh, cool. The other way around, you, you begin to just meld and then put your judgment on hold because right. we're new to this, right? So we have no right to walk into that and go, that's right, that's wrong, when, when we're just kind of learning along the way. And that was the perspective that we ended up choosing for the film is this is what it's like to be right behind the shoulder of a falconer. So we, you never leap ahead and kind of like watch the eagle coming in on the prey or anything, because that's totally artificial. So right. we, just, we just wanted to show people what it was like to be on this adventure and, and never really kind of ahead of the gamer. Um, we just wanted to keep it really authentic. No, it was, it was, it was from someone that's chased a lot of jackrabbits around the world, uh, it absolutely was authentic. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I asked this question because uh, so I think it was Lauren that mentioned about the time one of the eagles bit her in the lip and grabbed her in the arm and, and did all this. And that's a very, a very uh, common, everybody has to happen once. One of the common lines that I use when I'm teaching people about birds is they say, how strong is that bird? And I say, it's strong enough to take a 195 pound man to his knees. And it's because a talon in the arms ta arm takes care of it. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, we've all, we've had birds bite our lip, had birds bite what what's what's the one thing that got left on the editing floor that was the biggest uh, i don't want to say blooper but the biggest kind of cluster the biggest Not that I thing that went wrong i i know you have one yeah <laughs> well, there, there's there's two things i wanted to point out one is that lauren was not wild about that story being in the film but the reason was that i thought was kind of interesting 
it wasn't that it happened because like you said, it happens to everyone. This is when um, Dart gets her in the face at, at night. She just sat, she thought she sounded a little whiny in telling the story. Oh. <laughs> and she's just like, I don't want to sound whiny. Yeah, and this, this happens, happens to everyone. Yeah. So, yeah, so and I said, really okay, <laughs> you know, you know, you. I don't think anybody's going to think you're whiny. Um, but I think one of the interesting things that this was maybe our first day we were filming in the fields in um, in Kansas, and it was kind of a windy day. So our sound person had what's called a windscreen on his microphone, right. which anybody in film world knows <laughs> looks like a big furry mask, right? You see where this is going. <laughs> So Miles is, a, Miles is a new eagle, or he's kind of new to hunting. He's just learned to fly. He's just kind of learning how all this works. Lauren sees a rabbit off in the distance. He kind of lunges for it. She makes that quick split-second decision, I'm going to let him go. And he just, whoa, and lands right on our sound guy's head. Uh, and he's just like, uh, you know, frozen. So we, that was one of the early moves. We, we sort of decided no more windscreens. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Revere, Revere got a, a, a talon puncture uh, during the course of filming. You know, we he we're hands on. Yeah, we're hands on. But it's it's I think a rite of passage. You learned how to jam Neosporin into it really fast. <laughs> It is because you don't know what kind of funk is on those talons. And so yeah. it's good, but the, wind, the windscreen, I have to tell you the windshield on the mic is a story that uh, can go in with anybody that's done filming has had a bird grab one of those as well. So when you, you've learned about getting grabbed in the lid, you've learned about getting grabbed in the hand and you've learned about being careful what your mic looks like. So you, you've well, learned you know, all the essential. Had, in Italy, you know, we, we hadn't met Giovanni in person before we started filming with him. I mean, I met him, or Revere and I met him maybe two days before the rest of the crew got there, but it wasn't like Lauren where we had spent time with her in Scotland and we, we knew her a little bit before we started filming. So we'd, we hadn't been to the actual farm with our crew yet. And so we had to explain to them that we were gonna arrive and there are wolves and there's a horse and the horse is actually sort of the guardian of the farm. And if you make the horse mad, he'll trample you. And there are, you know, there are several mews and you're going to hear like 17 different birds of prey and who knows what else. Ferrets, there's ferrets in there. There's all oh, sorts of- Of course there's ferrets. Bit of, yeah, it's a bit of a menagerie. And so we were like, don't make eye contact with the wolves because we knew we were gonna be pulling in right behind Giovanni with the car and wanna get out and continue filming right away. And our crew was like, what, there's wolves? What do you mean? We're not going in there. And so <laughs> you just sort of have to learn to roll with it. I mean, it was a, the, the animals always kept us on our toes. And I think they created a situation where we all had to be pretty nimble and ready for an adventure. And that was really fun. Um, once we embraced it as a film crew, we had a really terrific team that traveled all over the world with us to make the film. And, um, you know, Ben Pritchard, our cinematographer at the beginning was like, what? How are we going to do this? This is impossible. But by the end, we are a pretty well-oiled machine chasing down things far away. Like, Yeah, well, what's interesting about Giovanni, I thought, is that you captured really well with him, I, I feel, the authenticity and kind of the simplicity of what he was seeking, right? So he was working to be a falconer, not, so the, as I talked about it, I mean, as you talked about it and showed him, his passion was falconer. I mean, as much as we, we've talked about with an artist, right? He would do anything he needed to uh, from teaching exercise or, or whatever it might be to be able to have time to go fly birds. And that's the way most falconers are right now, right? And so. Those are the way, when I learned falconry, those are the kind of guys I learned, learned from. And it's really interesting uh, to see, like I said, the authenticity and the, the passion that goes with that. And it, it's tied to anybody that's willing to put clay, uh, to model, uh, to mold clay or to put paint on a palette uh, and onto a canvas. And so I, I appreciate uh, how you, you captured that. Do you have any other additional kind of insights or? Or any lessons that you learned about that from Giovanni and, and kind of his lifestyle and 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 what he how he lived in order to be able to practice his art. Well, I think for one thing, the fact that his you know his father passed away early on in his life and left room for him to find another north star, and the fact that he found that 
you know, in the long dead Holy Roman Emperor, um, at first sounded a little odd to us. Um, <laughs> but then the more we found out about how important Frederick II's work was and still is to this day to falconers, and then learned about this amazing book in the Vatican Library, sort of started to put all these things together for us. And it just, it began to make a lot of sense that falconry is, yes, it's going out with a bird, but it's this whole culture. It's this whole value system. It's this whole portal to understanding yourself. Um, right. But that's why it can be so fulfilling 24 seven every day of the year. It's, it's not just that moment where you release the bird. Yeah, no, and that's good. So, you know, I, my dad is, is is just turned 80 and he flies a Gossock. Flies it every day. Nice. Uh, good he choice. Bought a farm, good choice. Hey, he bought a farm in Charlottesville, actually, so he could go fly his Gossock every day. And so uh, it's what gives him, it keeps him moving, right? I mean, it's it, 80 years old. Uh, he's flown this bird now for probably 18 or 19 years. So uh, it, he talks about what's going to happen when that part of his family is gone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's an interesting, an interesting discussion. Um, so what, um, you got, a, you had a really interesting insight into the difference between kind of, uh, Eastern falconry and Western falconry. Uh, and, uh, it, it, how, how did it differ? How did, and was, were the attitudes different? The equipment was obviously different, right? So you saw a Saker Falcon flying after a Hober or a, a Jeer Saker being trained very different than than a Harris Hawk that Giovanni was flying after grouse in the woods. What were some of the differences in in, in, in attitude and uh, in emotion and feeling? Was there any? Would we kind of talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I I think you know there are so many similarities, which which is what we started. With. Right. Here's these just such different lifestyles, such different places on earth, and yet the the respect for the bird was just through the roof in each case. Um, and the, the deep quest to understand what makes the bird work. Um, but in terms of the way they hunted, um, I would say that was led by the prey. Right. You know, the, the hubara the, is this, at least to, to my understanding, it's so fast that <laughs> only is. the fastest falcons in the world would be able to catch it. So not just right. a falcon because it's fast, but the fat, the Hussein bolts of the falcon <laughs> world. So yep. Khalifa is all about speed. And Lauren is more about, and partly because the eagle is more of a complex uh, creature in and of itself, but she seems to be more about the understanding of it and the, and the power. And then what I loved about Giovanni was, was when he hunts with these Harris hawks and they hunt in, in trios. And right. I believe just like wolves, they're one of the very few um, species that hunt as a team. And so to sort of see that play out in the forest where one swoops down to flush and the other one's that come overhead and the other one comes in. Uh, and the wolves sort of are it. there flushing things. I mean, it was like a whole <laughs> it was like an orchestra team. and that was super, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think like culturally, of course, there were differences between between all three of the characters. I'll never forget showing up at the falcon races which was actually right. one of the very Indie the bar. very first time very first times we were filming we started filming this film in dubai and i walked in and aside from our field producer i was the only woman for like oh. miles and it was so intimidating for a brief moment where I was like, whoa, whoa uh, what am I doing here? Am I even allowed to be here? But um, once we started to meet Khalifa and he really understood that our intentions for the film went beyond some Nat Geo special that, you know, right. is falconry in the UAE. He invited us into his home, which is something that, you know, is so rare um the access that he gave us the fact that he allowed us to embed with them when they went to azerbaijan is really unprecedented and we've become really close friends and we like to say that there's these sort of overlapping circles that all of the characters share and you know lauren and giovanni have had a chance to meet each other at a film festival unfortunately khalifa wasn't able to be there but i'm quite certain that all three of them would be friends they have enough in common that at the end of the day, 
you know, what they'd rather be doing, all of them, is be out with their birds. And so right. it's, a, it's a really unique um, bond that they have with the raptors. And that was something that we were really interested in. Like what drives a person to partner with an animal that can't be bothered to really care back? <laughs> and, and, and you captured that well, and, and is that the, these birds really, it's a working relationship, right? It's transactional. We're very bonded to them, but there's not necessarily that same transaction back. Actually, there's the old uh, kind of nomaker and falconry that I know some falconers that have had more wives than they've had birds. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so, it, which talks about kind of the eccentricity of falconry and the commitment that you have to the birds and the over, really the overriding, uh, it, 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 it controls everything you do because you've got an animal, a wild animal, that you want to keep just that you want to keep wild enough, but just tame enough, and, and and it relies on you for sustenance, but it needs to be kept fit. And I mean, it really is a tightrope. And I and I appreciate uh, how you you captured that, and I think you you figured that. Uh, so uh, our time is about up, but but as we wind up, what I'd like to ask each of you, kind of the final question, which is, what what what's the biggest takeaway, the biggest lesson? What's the one thing that each of you would like to say, hey, this is what I gained out of this. This is the emotion I got out of this. This is what I feel about it. This is why I'm glad I, I, I took this chunk of my life and, and produced this film. <laughs> oh, now I have to go first. Uh, <laughs> that's a really hard question. I think that the... Yeah, I, I think it's the ability to stay open to possibilities okay. that even when things don't go the way that you thought they were going to go at, in, in the moment, that it's really the journey to the destination that's important, not the destination I like that. That's, and, and Falcon really is about the journey. I, that's, that's, I appreciate that. Revere. I would, I would say that um, I, I read someplace um, that that the best art is also a reflection of its time, you know. That um, and what I like is that this film was started almost six years ago, and the world has obviously changed a lot in the past six years. And that this film doesn't necessarily push an agenda, but if you come with your heart open and your mind open, I, I feel like the film gets you fifty percent there, and then each person that sits down and brings their own experience and whatever they're working with that day or that it, I believe it offers some insight into the the big picture and I, I'm proud of that and that's that was a, yeah, thank, a goal of ours yeah. yeah no thank you very much you captured it well uh in 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 winding up I wanted to share one thing with everybody that's watching this especially in the U.S. all of these birds are protected you have to have a federal and a state license to practice it so if anybody watching this is really committed to go out and get a bird, talk, look up North American Falconers Association, which is uh, uh, Google North American Falconers Association or your state club, uh, your state probably has a club as well. So don't go out and make the mistake that someone did when they took the eagle uh, miles that Lauren right. was working with from the wild and go to do it. This is like real and, and there's a real process to do it. There's a legal way to do it. And if, and if this film, has touched that inner desire in you to go become a falconer. Remember, it's life life changing. It's all encompassing, but there's a legal way to do it as well. So I just leave that because we don't yeah. want a bunch of twelve year olds going out and taking birds from nests. <laughs> so, no, no, uh, we would we would love to inspire people to be falconers or just to reinvigorate their own connection to the wild. It may not require going as far as being a falconer, just as being more present and watching watching predation happen. You know, you can see it thousands of times in your backyard every day. But right. um, you know, we would love to hear from people. One thing about the pandemic is that we usually get the opportunity to do this kind of Q&A live with an audience and we can sort of get an idea of how people are feeling, what their experience of the film was. And, and unfortunately, you know, these difficult times have robbed us of that. So we have a website, which is overlandmovie.com. And on the website, there's a sort of contact us or comment, comment tab. And so if you have thoughts about the film that you'd like to share with us, we really would love to hear them. Um, if it touched you, if you, if you have anything, any questions, 
for us. We're totally open to answering them. So um, look us up and contact us there. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. And uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, we'll be talking again. So thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Dwayne.